Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Good Drum Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Yes, it's a special, well, sort of midweek episode of the show. Um, a couple of days off, so uh, having got the chores out of the way, what do you do on a day off? Taste whiskey, of course. Well, it's not really much much difference to an, an, an average day, it has to be said, but obviously this, today I'm sharing this tasting with, uh, with you guys. So um, anyway, this is uh, the last in the series of random in inverted commas episodes that I kind of pre-planned um, so obviously it'll be back to sort of figuring out what I'm going to do pretty, pretty much on the day but uh, anyway so we've done we've done random Irish we've done you know random other stuff um, I thought it was about time we did a rye episode of the show and you know not just obviously American rye I mean rye whiskey is, is made all around the world so uh, and I think I've got a really interesting tasting lined up you know this is truly you know a world rye tasting episode of the show so um, lots of uh, lots of interesting stuff to, to share with you and uh, hopefully um, you know you'll enjoy it so um, like the previous episodes I'm not going to go into too much great detail now I'll introduce obviously to the bottlings and give you a bit of information about the uh, sources of those particular bottlings, so um, might as well just uh, introduce the line of them. Okay, so the first, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, it's clear, look, <laughs> yes, the first bottling we're going to be looking at is uh, a completely unaged rye spirit, so <laughs> you can practically, I guess, call it vodka. Um, this is the Volson white rhino white rhino i've got absolutely no idea when the distillery is in france but anyway uh it's bottled at 41 percent and it's made from 100 percent organic uh rye it's a collaboration between uh the domain de haute glace uh in uh, in the alps uh as a farm distillery and uh some chap called xavier uh padovani of the experimental cocktail club no, I can't say I've ever heard of them either, but then I'm not really one for cocktails. As you know, I prefer my spirits completely as they are. Um, apparently they also do a single malt as well, um, which I don't think is particularly old. I think it's 18 month old, uh, so it's not even labelled as whiskey. I think it's just an organic rye spirit. But Today we're looking at the completely unaged, and I think this will be interesting because obviously that this should hopefully set the benchmark for what rye and the character of rye whiskey, um, without any influence from oak or uh, what have you. So I think that'll be a really interesting starting point. I just basically chose the <laughs> like most most times it's just a case of you know what order do you taste them and you may as well just taste them in the 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 level of abv so the second bottling we'll be looking at is bottled at 43.4 this is um a canadian rye and canada seems synonymous with with rye whiskey there um and th th this is the uh, jp Wizard double still rye double still you ask well um it is basically a mash of most predominantly rye, a little bit of uh, corn, and it was distilled in both column and pot still. So that yeah, could be really, really interesting. The distillery was founded in the late 1800s by a chap called John Philip Wizer, who was a Dutch farmer, and um, they've been producing a number of different uh, ryes. They do several, uh, including a very strange hopped whiskey, which I think is they use, they use beer or something like that. I have tasted it and it is quite peculiar, it has to be said. Experimental is not the word. But anyway, we're looking at uh, their newest uh, bottling, uh, I believe, which is the, the, the double still rye. So quite looking forward to that. I think that could be really, really interesting. Next bottling we'll be looking at is from Austria. Yeah, told you this is a, a worldwide rye tasting. Uh, this comes from the, now uh, I'm going to murder the name of this, um, Vod, Valdiveta Roggenhoff Distillery. Uh, now, this was founded by uh, the Haider family in 1995, uh, specifically a chap called Johan Haider. Um, and they produce a number of different uh, different ryes. Uh, they do a sort of a, their standard bottling is called the original rye, which is sixty percent unmalted rye and forty percent 
malted barley. They also do a pure 100% rye malt, a special rye malt nougat. Uh, I'll get onto the, that terminology in a bit. They do 100% single malt, a single malt caramel. Um, and then they do what they call their rare selections, which is one of which we're going to be looking at today. This is the dark rye. Now, apparently what they do is they have different levels of roasting the rye. So basically it would appear that they have, uh, they use the term nougat, caramel and dark, obviously to represent the, the different levels of toasting. And uh, so this is bottled at 46% and is obviously dark toasted rye. Um, I think it's 100% uh, rye. I'm, I'm get, yeah, I would imagine it's 100% rye. Uh, apparently they also do a peated rye, which <laughs> sounds pretty weird. Um, and is matured in ex sweet wine casks. I mean, I've got, I think, knocking around samples of pretty much all their other stuff. Um, so maybe one of these days I'll just do an episode of the show purely on, on those. So it could be interesting. Uh, the fourth one we'll be looking at is uh, uh, an American rye. <laughs> yes, time to get to, to America. Uh, this is the Mitchter's 10 year old rye. Single barrel, bottled at 46%. Um, because it was obviously a sample for the whiskey magazine, I don't know what the barrel number was. Um, this was released early in 2016. It's a straight rye whiskey. Now, you probably wonder, well, what's this straight rye whiskey business? Well, um, basically, straight rye whiskey has to be uh, dis initially distilled at no higher than 80%, um, aged for a minimum of two years in obviously virgin toasted oak casks and can be only filled into cask at a maximum of 62.5%. So that's, yeah, so you'll often see rye just labelled as rye whiskey, and then you'll see straight rye whiskey. So th there, you know, that's that's what the difference is. This was not a cheap bottling. Um, so for a 10 year old rye, this was, I think, retailing for nearly 103 pounds. So I hope for that money, it's bloody good. But anyway, we shall obviously get there. As you know, Mitch does have only just, I think, just recently completed their, their distillery. So again, like uh, a, a number of, um, uh, Americans and you know distilleries that uh, it's obviously bought in spirit, which was always the big hoo ha about Mitchers when it was first released. Uh, the fact that it was bought in spirit, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a bit like um, the distillery in Utah and uh, um, the High West distillery. You know, again, you know they decided to buy in stocks, and it's what's in the bottle that counts, in my opinion. But anyway. Right, fifth bottling uh, is a pretty legendary bottling. It's from the Buffalo Trace Stable. The lesser well-known label within the Buffalo Trace Stable, the E.H. Uh, e. Taylor. Again, this is a straight rye whiskey uh, made from rye and malted barley. Unlike the Sazerac rye, which they produce, which has uh, a proportion of corn. So should, this should be more natural rye, if you see what I mean. You know, kind of just a little bit of malted barley which probably won't actually generally give you much flavour input because you know it's only you know about five percent it's primarily there to get the fermentation going because most of the um, the rye is unmalted so a bit of a bitch to get going um and so yeah that's that's that one and finally the last bottle we'll be looking at is a real humdinger um again it's a single cask bottling um it's uh, the Sea Kale Single Barrel, uh, bottled at 66%. Ooh, yeah, I've got the water ready for that one. Um, now, Sea Kale uh, is bottled by a company called Laws Whiskey House in Denver, Colorado. Um, again, this, the, the rye is grown um, on the, a family-owned um, estate in San Luis Valley and is malted by the Colorado Malting Company. Funnily enough, in Colorado, um, they use the Sam Ash process, um, standard aging in 53 gallon uh, white oak new American casks, uh, and they do basically uh, two ranges. Um, they do um, obviously a bourbon and they do the rye, they do a four grain straight bourbon, 
uh, bottled at 95% proof. They do uh, a single barrel bourbon, uh, a single barrel bourbon at car strength, and then they do a bottle in bond uh, bourbon. Now, I thought that this whole bottle in bond business basically meant it was bottled in bond, but no, apparently there is a little bit more to it. It kind of takes the concept of straight bourbon or straight rye a little bit further um, in so far that um, it has to be the product of one distilling season it has to be the mash has to be made from products of one growing season it needs to be a minimum of four years old so obviously uh, this being a straight rye is going to be a minimum of four years old and it has to be bottled at a minimum of 50 percent then they do obviously the rye so they do the uh, um, standard small batch rye, single barrel rye, single barrel cast strength and a bottle in bond but this is obviously the single barrel cast strength that we'll be looking at and finally uh, the rye apparent, uh, uh, is uh, again pretty standard mash bill 95% rye 5% bourbon and finally they make uh, a uh, they do a malt whiskey and they do um, a wheat called the um, straight trick e cum don't know why they call it that, but um, and again they make two versions of that. They make a hundred percent wheat version and a ninety-six percent wheat version with four percent malted barley. So pretty much all of these distilleries are sort of doing some really, really interesting stuff, really pushing the boundaries of uh, the usage of different uh, grains. Um, pretty much the distilling techniques are pretty standard, apart from obviously the Wizards uh, double. Um, Double still jobby, um, you know, double distilled, etc., etc. But it's obviously the, the the mash bill, which is one of the things I love about the American whiskies and you know, world whiskies, is the fact that they have the ability to play around with the mash bill, unlike uh, they do in Scotland. So anyway, that's this afternoon's little lineup, and um, well, we might as well just make a start and uh, get to the Rhino then. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what the white rhino gives us on the nose then, shall we? Quite oily, um, as you would expect. As you would expect it to come off the still, it's quite young. It's got a softness, it's not particularly fainty, uh, which is quite nice. There's a, there's a pleasant degree of, of spicy rye, and I, I often find that rye seems to go in sort of one or two ways. It either becomes quite herbal, um, and I often pick up this kind of herbally rye note in a lot of uh, non-bourbon or rye whiskies, which I'm guessing is probably coming from the cask, or the rye can be really, really nice and spicy. And this is definitely in the spicy end of the, the spectrum. Nicely smooth, got a bit of a, a minerality to it. Nice sweetness to the, the, the oily character. Yeah, this is, this is really nice. Palette. Yeah, oh, it's got a nice intensity on the finish for 41%. I think that would be interesting at a higher ABV. But it's nicely balanced. It's got a bit of sweetness, it's got a bit of spiciness, um, plenty of rye character, um, a little bit of minerality, quite full, a bit earthy on the finish, you know, just quite quite nicely balanced. I think it's a, a really pleasant spirit, it will, and I think it would be interesting uh, if they did age that in uh, in oak. Um, I think the, if memory serves me correctly, the the malt that they do is aged partly in virgin oak casks, and I think wine casks or cognac casks or something like that. Uh, I think it would be interesting to see um, what uh, what the rye turns out like being aged in something like that. I mean, I've not tasted the the, the malt. Maybe I will do it in, in due course. Um, well, if you're watching from the distillery, send me some samples, that'd be great. But um, on, on the evidence of this, I think this is really nice. And if you're into your vodkas and things like that, then, you know, this has certainly um, got really loads and loads of character, uh, which is obviously what you want from an unaged spirit or a vodka or something like that. So, um, so yeah, not particularly expensive either. Um, yeah, nice start, I think.
Okay, so let's move on to the Canadian, on to the uh, JP Wizard double still. Uh, see what the nose gives us on this then, shall we? Quite a bit of oak in actual fact. Um, youthful herbal. So this is the opposite end of the of the kind of rye spectrum. Um, it's got quite a sweetness. It's almost almost kind of a refilled sherry kind of herbal sweet kind of character. Um, almost malty, quite dense, which is obviously the, the, the pot still um, distilled component. But there's also sort of a crisp, almost kind of grainy um, note kind of coming through, which is obviously from the column still. So in actual fact, it really just comes across just like a Canadian uh, blended whiskey, but just obviously not blended, if you see what I mean, um, which is, is really intriguing, I think. Um, it's nicely balanced. Again, like I said, it's more of the herbal uh, type of rye. Yeah. I'm really enjoying this. I think this is a, a lovely whiskey. It's a bit young. It's, it's got an edge to it, but I think it's certainly got, certainly on the nose, plenty of weight, um, which is uh, which is nice. It's good. Hello. charcoal on the finish almost a, almost almost peaty maybe there is a bit of peat in uh, in there I don't know uh, again quite weighty it's relatively simple um, quite full fairly sweet um, but not cloyingly sweet that the, the kind of, I think the column still matured spirit is kind of giving it that slight sort of uh, grip that slight sort of spicy uh, element a bit like a blended whiskey, what you would want from a blended whiskey with with the grain component kind of you know balancing up against the sort of like the malt. So, so yeah, pleasant. I think I think I prefer the nose more than the palate. I think the palate is pretty simple and straightforward, but you know I think that that delivers uh, delivers quite pleasantly. So um, so yeah, hmm, not bad. Okay, so let's move on to the Austrian. Let's see what those gives us. Oh, pungent! God, oh, bloody hell! That is young. That is oily, mar-like, intense. You you can certainly smell the dark roasting um, of the rye. Quite spicy. But it's it's just so so young. Not fainty, um, but but mar like. It's got that high toned kind of character. I'm not getting a huge amount of oak, so it's kind of a little unbalanced. Um, and I must admit, from tasting the um, the other spirits that they do, this kind of seems to be a bit of a hallmark. Um, and I'm, I mean, you know, the distillery what has been around since 1995, so um, they should have some mature spirit knocking around. I would have thought, but so far everything that I've tasted from from the distillery does seem to come across like it's about three years old, and this is certainly no exception. I mean, yes, it's interesting um, from a kind of sort of nerdy kind of way, and I suppose bottling it younger without too much oak influence is going to allow the sort of you to experience the kind of the, the levels of roasting uh, and I think that would probably be quite an interesting tasting to to see that and it certainly like I said comes across quite dark and there's a almost kind of toff not toffee sort of um, treacly kind of note kind of coming through sort of yeah burnt sort of slightly burnt at the edges um, but you yeah. know Interesting, pal. Mm. 
pretty much like the nose. It's very young, it's very quite spicy, um, oily, ma-like, intense, very dry in finish. It feels quite tannic on, on, on the finish. Um, whether that's to do with the sort of like the dark toasting of the rye or or the oak, um, I don't honestly know. But the oak certainly hasn't given it any kind of vanillin character. Um, it's a little bit bitter, but that kind of bitterness is not too bitter. It's kind of wrapped up in the sort of the spicy rye. Interesting. I mean, you know, I think it'd be a case of you know what would that retail for? If that retail for a, a sensible price. You would say, yeah, okay, I'll I'll check that out. It might be something a bit interesting. It's not maybe something I would want to drink all of the time. Um, but my guess is that because it's a special forty-six percent bottling, it's probably not going to be cheap. I mean, there may well be um, some of you that watch the show that live in Austria, and I guess you could probably tell me uh, what it's uh, retailing for. I don't know if it's actually in the UK or not, but um, Interesting experiment, and, and and I suppose that's that's part of the thing I love about these whiskies is the experimental nature of them. But I think there comes a point where you need to give it plenty of time, you know. But like I said, maybe if it did spend too much time in the cask, you'd lose the the the, the kind of intrinsic uh, dark rye kind of character. Who knows? Without uh, tasting an aged version of uh, of their spirit, it's it's you know you you're kind of making assumptions. But you know. Interesting, nevertheless, I think. Right, okay, and moving on to the mixtures. Let's uh, see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Oh yes, now that smells like it has a bit of age to it. Luscious, soft, honeyed. A little bit of spiciness, a little bit of herbalness. Um, kind of classic American rye. There's some lovely oak behind it, not too dominating. It's very beautifully balanced, it has to be said. You know, it's just enough oak to to um, stand up to the, uh, the spiciness of the rye. The, the, the oak is coming through a little bit more now. I'm getting more of that sort of toasted vanilla, a little bit of charcoal, a little bit of coconut, Oh, oh, that is absolutely gorgeous. Um, hundred and something odd quid. What was that? Hundred and three, hundred and two ninety-five. Yeah, I can, I can see that. It's certainly got the complexity and the depth to sort of, you know, warrant that kind of price tag. Um, oh, that, that is stunningly good. Now, I mean, I couldn't tell you what, where, it, what the uh, origin of it was, but damn, that is fine, fine rye. Palette. It's a silky mouthful, complex, orange conserve, a little bit of vanilla, a bit of spicy rye, a little bit of herbal character, a touch of treacle, honey, some gentle vanilla oak kind of coming through right on the finish. Oh, that is a lovely progression. That is absolutely stunning stuff. Um, a little bit of dark, bitter chocolate as well, right on the finish, right on the end of the finish. I mean, that is... Mmm, ah, mmm. I mean, you know, I don't really care if it's not been distilled by them. That's just, it, like I said to you, it's what's in the bottle. I think that counts, you know. And um, oh, oh, that that is good. Okay, so let's move on to the E. H. Taylor. I think that's this has got some uh, something to go for. Uh, if it's going to live up to the uh, the mixtures, that was uh, that was damn good. Um, so let's, let's see when those goes. Fresher, more intense, crisper, almost, almost saline-like. Um, again, it's got that lovely herbal and spice character, kind of rye character. Um, a little bit of honey, a little bit of toffee. Again, the oak is very much in the background and it's supporting rather than, I'm not getting a huge amount of vanilla in. So you're getting all that lovely rye character. It's it's got a more possibly a slightly more natural 
character than the mixtures where the mixtures is a lot broader, softer and more succulent. This has got a little bit more of an edge to it, a little bit more grip. Um, oh, oh, this is lovely. There's a little bit of smoke drifting through now, so charred wood smoke, bit of vanilla. Mm. Oh, it's complex. I mean, again, this is this is not cheap. Uh, I mean, I think what the E. H. Taylor small batch is about 117, and I think this is probably about 120, 130. I think, but oh my God, that's bloody good. I mean, this has got to be around the same sort of age as the mixtures. Um, I would, I would guess. Um, but like I said, it's certainly got more vibrancy, and it's just a completely different beast. Um, and oh, that's a damn good beast. Palette. Oh my God, the maturity on that finish is absolutely stunning. Mature oak, spirit, again some lovely rye spice, not quite so herbal. Again, has that sort of real natural rye character, not very much oak at all, just a, a smidgen of vanilla kind of coming through. It's got some dark chocolatey spice, uh, a little bit of coffee, treacle. Whoa, it's got some grip to it as well, some intensity. That is stunning. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of the mixtures and that, totally chalk and cheese, you know, both amazing quality whiskies, but just so completely different. Um, I would guess the mixtures is probably the kind of classic um, rye, corn, Possibly a little bit of uh, malted barley, whereas, like I said, the the um, E. H. Taylor is just pretty much rye and malted barley, and it just allows that sort of real intensity to kind of come through. That's just like, oh my god, that's bloody good. Mm. Mm, I love that. And finally, on to the C. Kale now. Um, it's probably a little bit unfair tasting it after those two magnificent rise, it has to be said. But it is 66%, so it's like, you know, you, you kind of choose your kind of your lineup. Uh, and, and like I said, I mean, for me, the easiest thing to do is just do it on, on ABV. So I know this is not going to have the complexity. It's only four years old or, or there or thereabouts. So, but anyway, let's, let's give it a, a fair crack of the whip then, shall we? Oh my god, that's pungent. Again, raw, um, spirity, sort of fainty, but not, you know, um, overly fainty. Quite balsamic, um, dark treacle. It's got kind of like an almost, almost kind of marjoram dried spirit. Herbs kind of note, um, real rawness, a real raw rye. It's almost like kind of sniffing the actual, um, you know, cereal it's kind of itself. Um, yeah, well, that's intense. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't smell like 66%. Um, it's the spirit is just so big, it's kind of absorbed all that, um, alcohol, and it's really, really well. Integrated, it has to be said. It's I'm, you know, I'm not kind of going. Oh my God, alcohol prickle all over the place. Um, you know, you stick your nose in this, and you, you would have thought this was about fifty percent, not you know, over sixty. It's interesting. Um, I think is the, the, the word I would use. I mean, it's certainly got complexity. It's got some interest. Um, it's kind of got that sort of almost kind of wheaty flake kind of note to it, you know, that kind of crushed um, rye palette. Oh, 
bloody hell. Oh, that is intense. That is intense. Alcoholic, pungent, mari, bitter is not the word for it. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, almost sucking all the moisture out of your face. I mean, bloody spicy. I mean, you know, let, kind of, once, it, once your eyes stop watering, the spice is just kind of like going mm, all over the tongue. It's just like a, intense is not the word. Um, raw, dark, a little bit of bitter chocolate, bitter oak, alcohol. Mmm. Oh, it's a hit, I can tell you that. Um, it's very primary, it's all very up there and sort of, you know, intense. Um, I'm going to put a little drop of water with that and see uh, see if that does uh, anything to it. Um, like I said, I mean, the, um, the nose just kind of <laughs> certainly didn't prepare you for that palette, I can tell you that for a start. So... Um, Let's see what a little drop of water does to it now. There's a bit of a slight metallic edge to it. Um, it's, it's certainly more fainty now. There's certainly more of those kind of spirity impurities that, that you know, a bit more time in the oak would have kind of removed. It's still very dark and pungent and intense, I mean, a real dark rye kind of character. Um, yeah. Intense. I can actually taste something now. It's very cereally, very young, very mari, very herbal. I mean, it's like kind of, I guess, looking out the inside of a bloody mash tun. Um, I mean, just a mouthful of cereal. It's just too, too young. I mean, again, it, I suppose it kind of comes down to that sort of like, what's the retail price of it? And again, I haven't got a clue. Um, I don't think it's available in the UK. Um, but if you were to say that's about 35 quid, uh, 40 quid, then, you know, you'd say, fine, you know, it's an interesting experiment. But, A, it's cast strength, it's limited edition, a single cast bottling, so you know that it ain't going to be cheap. Um, and, you know, if you were to say to me, 90 quid for that, I'd just go, no, not worth it. Worth it as a you know, interesting in little bottles, you know, this is this is our, our young kind of rye spirit, this is how, how it's kind of going. Um, sure, no problem with that, but no, if you were to say 90 quid for that, then, uh, well, unless you're a bit of a bloody masochist, um, it's, that's pretty heavy going, and again, it's not something you'd want to drink all of the time. Um, but it's interesting, and I suppose you can argue that not ageing it for so long means not quite so much oak and... and but, and you're getting the purity of the rye, but then the, 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 both the Mitchters and the E.H. Taylor, which obviously have some age, kind of blow that theory right out of the water, you know. Um, it just seems to me that that's, I guess there's kind of a turning point. Um, I mean, as we know with, with, with oak aging, any spirit, that your initial um, period of, uh, of, of aging is more about the oak removing impurities from the spirit. And then it kind of turns to add vanillins and add the sort of like the, certainly if you've got brand new toasted oak casks, um, again, it's dependent upon obviously the depth of the char and how much of the oak character is going to be removed. But, you know, there comes a point when it starts to flip over the other way around, when the oak can give no more vanilla and character like that. And so you're then into the sort of oxidative um, maturation period and the kind of the spirit starts to come back and, you know, balances up the overtly oaky character. I mean, if you taste, say, something like you know, a young, a young bourbon, um, Jack Daniels, for example, of number seven, it's just big fat corn and big fat oak, and that's it, so it's three years, and it's obviously matured pretty quickly, given, dumped a load of uh, oak character in there to sort of go along with the big fat corn, 
but give it a bit more time and you start to get secondary characteristics, you get more elegance, more, 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 more um, complexity. Um, and so basically at the end of the day what I'm trying to say is there is no substitute for age at the end of the day. You know, leave your spirit well alone until it's ready for bottling. I mean, you know, some people may argue and say, well, it is ready for bottling. It's got some interest. It's where we're at at this present moment in time. And like I said, brilliant. No problem with that whatsoever. But bear in mind what it's going to retail for and, and ask yourself the question, is it worth it? Yeah, the, the price that you're actually charging, because sometimes it just just isn't, you know. Um, because I'm at the I'm at the, the kind of sharp end of the stick. I'm the one that's selling it to the general public, to you guys. Um, and I think maybe sometimes distillers just don't kind of take that into consideration. They think, right, well, this is what we're going to charge. You sell it, you know. Um, and they don't put themselves in the consumer's shoes to a certain extent because it's their baby at the end of the day, you know, and, and this is what this is the money they want for it. And so, you know, kind of you're, you're kind of a bit buggered, really, because that's what you've got to deal with. Um, and very rarely, <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, blanket kind of um, comment, I suppose, rarely do distilleries kind of listen uh, well, I, I don't know because I very rarely have that kind of. I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not a distributor. You know, um, all I can say is that certainly we distribute wine and we have conversations with the wine producers. You know, uh, certainly when it comes to setting the prices and things like that. And you know, you say right. Well, this is what the market can take. This is what you know. We don't think you should put your prices up this year, or maybe just you know be. Um, yeah, reasonable with with a very small price increase. Um, I don't know whether distributors have that kind of same conversation with distillers. Possibly, um, I, I honestly don't know because I'm I'm not in that position. But it certainly seems to me that it's it's you know it's the distillers that kind of lead off on this. They say right, this is what we're going to sell it for, or this is what we're going to sell it to you. There you go. Do your job. You you work out you know how much margin you want to make and all that kind of stuff. And the problem is, of course, that they're just that they're not in the groove of of the whole thing. It's it's a case of it's fine if you can buy directly from the distillery, um, but if you can't, you've obviously got to buy it through um, a wholesaler, and that adds another level of margin onto it, and, and so on and so forth. And it's you, you know you, it's it's economics at the end of the day. And sometimes you know you just. You just taste stuff and you just think yeah, it's just too expensive or, or whatever, you know. Um, and anyway, anyway, I'm just bloody waffling on here and you're probably getting bored and switched off by now anyway. So, well, there you have it. That's that's this week's episode of the show. Uh, it's a really interesting rise. And I mean, so much for a bloody global shortage of rye, it has to be said. Um, you know, I've not, not personally seen it. I mean, they say that there's, there's very little of it knocking around, but there seems to be always plenty of rye whiskey of some form or description on the shelves. So anyway, this is this week's episode of the show in the bag, as they say. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have, you know, tweet about it, all that kind of stuff, you know, social media. Um, anyway, all that's left to say is good ramming and good afternoon. <laughs>